Hello, everyone, again. Uh, thank you very much for your time for uh, joining us today for this uh, webinar. Um, I hope that uh, a little bit more of the attendees will join us uh, during the webinar, but uh, we're ready to start right now. So uh, today, during the webinar, we're going to be presenting two lectures uh, about atomic force microscopy technique, uh, as well as a, uh, the integration with different optical techniques, such as Kanpoko Raman. And uh, the first presenter is going to be Dr. Stanislav Leesman, the uh, head of the application department at uh, NTMDT uh, Spectrum Instruments Company. Uh, before we start, please pay, uh, pay attention on the small window from the GoToWebinar uh, that you have on your screen. Uh, there's uh, two options that you see there. Uh, one is the questions and second one is the chat. So uh, during the webinar, please feel free to send your questions about any materials you would like to discuss. Uh, we will try today to address all of your questions uh, during the webinar. If some of your questions are not going to be dis uh, addressed during the webinar, uh, we will send the follow-up emails uh, after the webinar with the answers. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. Stanislav Leesmint, uh, again, head of the application departments of NTMPT Spectrum Instruments. And he's going to be talking uh, right now about the AFM frontiers from functional materials to bio applications. Stanislav? Yeah, uh, thank you, Oleg. Uh, uh, do you hear me? Uh, is, is my sound OK? Yes, all good. Uh, yeah, OK, OK. Uh, good evening, dear colleagues. Uh, my name is uh, Stanislav Lismant. Uh, I'm working in NTMDT company. Just a few words about uh, the company. Uh, during the last 30 years, we have developed uh, uh, tens of uh, AFM and AFM related products and distributed uh, it, uh, them in 4,000, roughly 4,000 locations in uh, 64 countries around the world. And uh, we have the network of uh, uh, distributors and uh, our own offices uh, around the world. So here you can see the map. Uh, unfortunately, the world is too big to indicate all the places we have installed our equipment. Maybe uh, this uh, this one uh, is more interesting, like a uh, more closer view for Europe, for a uh, near Middle East, for Asia. And um, my today task was to tell uh, about the main applications and capabilities uh, of our atomic force microscopes. Unfortunately, this is impossible because it would take at least, uh, I think, 10 hours or something like that. So just uh, uh, for your understanding, our customers uh, publish more than thousands of scientific uh, papers annually in uh, journals with average impact factor of uh, 3.2. So I just uh, chose some several examples of quite trendy applications in the field of uh, smart materials and uh, biological applications and they will try to show you how the AFM can be applied to these uh, topics. So first a uh, few words about how AFM works. We have uh, the sample, uh, we, ha we have the uh, uh, atomic force uh, microscope tip uh, which is called cantilever. We focus laser on the back side of the cantilever reflected to the photodiode and uh, thus we can uh, measure the bending of the cantilever and uh, uh, bending is uh, directly connected to the uh, uh, force interaction between the uh, tip and the sample. Uh, thus uh, uh, we are doing atomic force microscopy with uh, positioning the sample under the tip uh, with high precision. Uh, another way of doing AFM is to position the tip. Uh, the, the sample is fixed and we move the tip uh, in uh, X, Y, and Z directions. And thus we can probe uh, different properties of, uh, of the surface at nanoscale. There are uh, mainly three ways of uh, keeping interaction between the tip and the sample. First is uh, contact mode. Uh, second is uh, oscillatory resonant mode or uh, amplitude modulation mode. Uh, and the third is uh, 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 oscillatory non resonance mode, we call it hybrid mode. And uh, during my talk, I will uh, mention all of them. So let's start with uh, uh, AM AFM, amplitude modulated atomic force microscopy. So you can uh, all, you have uh, probably heard also other names of this mode, stepping mode, amplitude modulated AFM, semi-contact mode, uh, and etc. But uh, the principle is uh, the same. We are oscillating the cantilever at its resonance frequency mechanically, and the uh, tip comes to the surface, and uh, the damping of the amplitude 
is equal to some uh, to some force interaction and uh, we are trying to keep this force interaction co constant uh, while scanning the sample so thus uh, first of all we can get the morphology or topography of the sample and uh, there are a few examples of uh, uh, how the AFM is used to uh, get uh, the information, uh, the morphological information about the sample. Uh, first of all, it's, of course, it's interesting to see some higher resolution imaging. So in, on this slide, you can see some example of uh, uh, E. coli ribosomes, which are pretty tiny. So the whole, uh, the size of the whole image is uh, 350 nanometers, which is uh, uh, fairly uh, close to the uh, limit of optical microscopy. On, uh, on this uh, uh, image from the right side, uh, there are a couple of uh, uh, rhinovirus particles, and uh, we cannot, uh, can see uh, not only the particles themselves, but we can see the fine structure, which is hexagonal in this case, and resolution is also pretty high. And uh, on this slide, uh, we can see the newsmaker of last two years, uh, the particle of uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, virus. Uh, coronavirus, uh, which are already deposited on the microsurface, and uh, we can uh, reveal the uh, particles uh, themselves, and uh, also can see those coronas, uh, which are stirring from uh, the from the two different directions, and uh, which bring us uh, so many troubles these years. Uh, in the following work, uh, AFM morphological studies uh, help to verify the process of uh, synthesis and discover the properties of novel silver-coated DNA molecules, which can be used as uh, one-dimensional conductors. So, and uh, in the in the AFM was used to reveal morphology with high resolution as well. Uh, the, this uh, interesting work, uh, where uh, our customers were studying the uh, the Drosophila eye. Uh, the thing is that uh, insect eyes have uh, an anti-reflective coating owing to nanostructures on the corneal surface creating a gradient of, inter of reflective index. So in this work, AFM was used to study the morphological uh, structure of Drosophila uh, co uh, eye coating to perform the reverse engineering to use this knowledge uh, in the future to design the novel reflective coating coatings. Uh, that's, uh, uh, so morphology is uh, fine, the higher resolution is fine, but uh, we also can use the AFM tip not only to image the surface, but uh, we can, uh, if we vary the distance between tip and the sample, we can probe the mechanical and adhesive properties of the sample. So we uh, uh, tip is moving uh, up and down, and uh, depending on uh, the, uh, the area, if the area is soft or the area is hard, we are getting different kinds of force distance curves. And if we apply the uh, one of the models of contact mechanics, we can uh, evaluate uh, quantitative numbers uh, from uh, these uh, force distance curves, and uh, this is called QNM, Q quantitative nanomechanics, uh, nanomechanics. And uh, these uh, numbers are like the young models and uh, uh, force of adhesion, worker of adhesion, and etc. And uh, uh, okay, on the on this slide we can see one more example of uh, why the morphology uh, imaging is uh, so important. So uh, uh, this is the mor morphology of melanoma cells, and uh, from the left side we see the living uh, live cell. Uh, on the middle slide, uh, there is a dead cell, and uh, actually on the uh, on the right slide, uh, on the right slide, we see that that this cell is uh, start to to divide, and uh, this is what <coughs> gives us the morphology. But on the next slide, uh, there is example what you can see from the force distance uh, mapping, and uh, these are uh, different examples of force distance curves taken at different locations of the sample. And you, you can see that uh, on the hard substrate, we see uh, these uh, curves are coinciding and the, there is high uh, uh, high angle of the curve. Uh, and in the middle of the cell, we can see that uh, the, we, we first of all get the plastic, some plastic deformation. And the second, uh, this curve shows us that the Young's modulus of the, uh, of the cell is much uh, lower than the substrate. And uh, on the side, we see something intermediate. Uh, another um, nice uh, 
example uh, from uh, one of our, our customers. Uh, he um, he has a farm of uh, uh, recluse spiders, about 100 pieces, and <clears throat> and uh, the, this group is uh, uh, studying the mechanical properties of uh, spider silk. Actually, these guys are not very pleasant because if you get a bite, uh, you will probably survive, but you'll get uh, uh, your uh, your skin wounded. So they are, what they are doing, they are uh, they are making spiders sleep, uh, and uh, uh, with the seal two, and uh, then uh, harvest the seal and uh, map the map its uh, morphology and uh, mechanical properties. The interesting thing is that uh, the silk uh, is uh, 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 is uh, five times harder than uh, than a special steel if it would be this of the same size. So it's very very interesting and very important to to see to see what what are the mechanical properties. And in this uh, paper, it was shown that uh, the Young's modulus of uh, of a single uh, piece of a single fiber of silk is uh, about uh, 21 gigapascal. It was done also by uh, measuring measuring measurement of uh, the force distance curves. And uh, also uh, uh, the breaking strength of the single uh, nanofibril is about 120 nanonewtons. So it was uh, measured by scratching the uh, single fibril with the AFM tip. Uh, that's a big guy. Uh, so in this uh, work, uh, the, 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 the people, uh, our customers were studying uh, non-fixed maze roots, which were cut with the uh, microtome, and uh, uh, they were looking for the morphology and probing the mechanical properties of uh, uh, different organellas. And uh, they, um, uh, it was shown that uh, the availability of such a method uh, increases uh, the level of understanding of the role of individual tissues in plant uh, growth perform performance. So that's again about nanomechanics. Uh, and uh, for finally, in this section, uh, also a very important work, uh, a fresh one uh, from uh, Vox Sanguini, uh, where, where the group is showing that uh, they, they were studying the red blood cells, which, which are stored uh, from donors. And uh, normally the, the, the age, uh, the period uh, during which the blood can be stored is about 40, 42 days. But they showed that uh, even after, uh, after 21 day, the, the morphology and the mechanical properties of uh, red blood cells are changing. That means that uh, after 20 uh, days, uh, uh, this uh, blood, uh, it, it can be used, but the properties of the, the, this blood are uh, degrading. So and uh, the uh, Young's modulus of uh, uh, of blood, red blood cells is changing, and the morphology of the cytoskeleton is also changing. Okay, that's uh, uh, all. These four distance nanomechanical studies are great, but uh, one there is one huge disadvantage: they are quite slow. Uh, for example, to collect uh, one map of two five twelve by five twelve points, it will roughly take uh, more than three days. So, uh, which is quite long. So, uh, uh, so uh, let's move to the next uh, to the next imaging technique, which is uh, called uh, non-resonance oscillatory mode, or we call this hybrid mode. Also, you can uh, have uh, probably have heard the name jumping mode. Uh, the principle is the same. We are varying the distance between tip and the sample with a pretty high frequency of a few kilohertz. And uh, measuring the force response during this, uh, uh, during the each cycle, and uh, knowing the trajectory of the scanner, and the force response of the cantilever, we can uh, plot the force distance curve in each point, and calculate uh, in real time uh, all this non nanomechanical uh, uh, stuff uh, like uh, deformation, stiffness, adhesion, and so on. Uh, but first of all, this mode can be also used as a mode for uh, to study the morphology of the samples and sometimes yeah for this is a, one of the examples of uh, application of this mode so from the left uh, side we see uh, some uh, polymer blend so some matrix and uh, 
spherical uh, particles. Uh, but if we look at the map of adhesion and E modulus, we can uh, understand that uh, uh, there are these uh, uh, islands uh, uh, have a higher modulus, and uh, thus we can understand that we have a soft matrix and uh, uh, hard uh, uh, hard particles included in this matrix, and we can uh, uh, do this uh, via the direct measurement. Uh, also, there are, in some cases, it is uh, not uh, not possible to get good imaging in a uh, tapping mode. And if I'm using the contact mode, uh, in this case, we are damaging the sample. So, the, like uh, the compromise is using the hybrid mode. Uh, on this uh, the slide, uh, you can see the example of uh, application of hybrid mode uh, for, the, for to study the tungsten disulfide monolayers in a vacuum conditions. Uh, the thing is that uh, our AFM can be operated not only in uh, ambient conditions, but uh, in controlled gas at atmosphere and uh, also in a uh, low vacuum up to 10 minus 3 minus 4 tor. And uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, this particular case, uh, you, you see from the right side, uh, the topography was very blurry because of huge uh, surface potential of the sample. And the only way, and the, in the contact mode, we were cutting these uh, flakes. The only way of uh, getting the uh, image in uh, vacuum conditions was to use the hybrid mode. Uh, let's uh, go to the next mode, which is based on the contact mode. So, if we have a, a sample with a, the different conductivity, and we have the tip. Uh, which uh, has a conductive coating. We apply some uh, voltage between tip and the sample, and uh, together with morphology, we measure the conductivity. In uh, the, so the conductive points uh, areas will give us higher current, and non-conductive will give, uh, not give us the current. And uh, one of the examples uh, here on on this uh, uh, conductive uh, uh, one of the examples of this uh, of conductive AFM. So uh, uh, this uh, uh, this work wa was uh, in this work, uh, conductive AFM was used to confirm the photo efficiency uh, at the green boundaries uh, of the NOVA approach for to non-vacuum energy efficient production of solar cells. And from the left side we see uh, the morphology of the sample, and uh, from the right side we uh, right side we see the conductivity which was achieved on the boundaries of these uh, uh, grains. Uh, another nice uh, uh, nice way of application uh, of uh, uh, conductivity uh, was done when the probe uh, when uh, there was an array of uh, uh, nanotubes and these nanotubes uh, changed uh, dramatically their conductivity when the probe mechanic was mechanically uh, pressing uh, these nanotubes or bending them and uh, the, this uh, in the, 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 this uh, work uh, she showed us that uh, uh, the, these uh, structures can be used uh, as a as a special nano sensors. Uh, but uh, again, uh, the uh, the CFM standard CFM uh, standard con conductive mode uh, can be uh, cannot be used with these uh, samples uh, which are fragile or which are not uh, fixed well on the uh, on the uh, substrate. In case of contact mode, we will either destroy the sample, uh, destroy the objects, or move them. So again, the, uh, we can overcome this uh, issue with the hybrid mode. Uh, we are doing a, a mapping of a morphology in standard, in standard hybrid way, and uh, we are applying voltage and measuring the current only during the uh, time when the tip is in the contact with sample. Thus, we avoid the lateral uh, lateral interaction between tip and sample. <coughs> and here is the example of a nanotube, which was uh, connected to the electrode. And in contact mode, uh, it was not possible to image the structure because tip was moving this nanotube. And uh, but in hybrid mode, we could uh, could uh, really see the conductivity of the electrode and of the nanotube. And uh, we see that uh, not all the parts of the nanotube. Uh, uh, like uh, uh, shown with this green arrow in the bottom uh, are conductive because this part of the nanotube, uh, this nanotube is not connected to the electrode. Uh, one more uh, example of 
current mapping and uh, nanomechanical mapping uh, of the same uh, bunch of nanotubes, uh, single wall nanotube and multi wall nanotubes uh, with a hybrid mode. Uh, um, uh, here we measured uh, the conductivity and the uh, mechanical properties uh, of uh, uh, nanotubes on the surface uh, and it was not possible to do it uh, on uh, uh, with a contact mode standard uh, CAFM. Uh, next uh, technique I wanted to point out was uh, the piezo response force microscopy because uh, the piezo electrics are uh, good uh, representatives of uh, uh, smart materials. So in standard uh, PFM, we are applying alternating voltage between tip and the sample, and so tip is in the contact with the sample, and uh, if there is some polarization on the surface, uh, the some domain structure, we will see a response in a vertical or lateral direction. And uh, it's, uh, uh, there are uh, thousands of works uh, published uh, on, on this topic. And uh, again, uh, for example, in this work, uh, the uh, the piezo domain imaging of piezo ceramics uh, was uh, done uh, to see the dependency uh, of material on uh, uh, niobium doping, and it was shown that the increase of uh, doping dose uh, uh, decreases the size of domains. But again, there is no problem when you have a good uh, rigid sample, a uh, good, good uh, stiff sample, and uh, to study it in contact mode. So uh, again, if we face uh, the, the, with the case when we need to study something soft or something what is not uh, uh, attached to the sample uh, substrate uh, very well, uh, again, the compromise is using the uh, uh, hybrid PFM. And uh, in hybrid PFM, we uh, measure the piezo response only during the time when the tip is getting into contact, in contact with the sample. We can do it uh, uh, simultaneous uh, mapping of uh, uh, two channels, uh, the lateral response, in-plane response, and the out-of-plane response, and do it in uh, this jumping or hybrid mode. And uh, in the, uh, this example uh, was, uh, is, uh, is about the studies of diphenyl alanine uh, peptide nanotubes. And in previous works, it was shown that, uh, okay, this is possible, uh, these uh, nanotubes have the, uh, the polarization, but it was not possible to measure uh, thin nanotubes. So uh, with the, when we got, uh, 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 the researchers were getting to thinner nanotubes, so they were broken as shown on, on this slide. And, but uh, with application of hybrid PFM, we could measure really thin nanotubes uh, with a radius above, about uh, from 30 to 150 nanometers. And uh, here you see the morphology of these nanotubes. And uh, on the right image, you see the piezo response. And these uh, nanotubes, we're showing uh, the uh, polarization in different directions. And that, that was uh, the only way of, uh, uh, of uh, getting the piezo response from these objects. Uh, another nice uh, application of uh, P, uh, hybrid PFM is, uh, was um, the, the demonstrated on uh, uh, the TGS sample uh, with uh, uh, observing uh, the uh, the phase transition in situ. So in the beginning of the scan, we have the domain structure. Uh, then we start to heat it. We see how the domain structure changes. Uh, the, uh, the size of, of domains uh, becomes smaller. And finally, uh, the domain structure disappears. And this was also possible only with hybrid mode because in contact mode, the parasitic bending of the cantilever uh, is uh, very huge and we cannot image it uh, during, uh, during the heating. Uh, one one more example, uh, uh, actually, also the fresh work of our customers from Taganrog, and uh, uh, they were studying the piezo response and conductivity of uh, arrays of piezo tubes, and uh, uh, it was also possible uh, possible to measure only in hybrid mode because uh, these uh, nanotubes were. Uh, were uh, vertical and uh, scanning in contact mode uh, was destroying the structure. Uh, if you, uh, uh, together with the uh, PFM, we can uh, also measure the electrostatic response between tip and the sample when we have uh, the sample metal pack and the, we use tip as a second electrode and uh, applying, uh, detecting the uh, response and different harmonics. Uh, first of all, we can 
uh, measure the topography. Uh, uh, on the second, uh, on the first uh, electrical harmonic, we can uh, get the surface potential, the DC by DZ and DC by DV, and do it also sim simultaneously. Uh, so one of the examples of this uh, Kelvin probe uh, approach was the study of uh, uh, graphene at, ver at a variable uh, uh, environment conditions. And uh, it was uh, shown that uh, in ambient, in vacuum, at uh, uh, dry gas, at, and at, at different uh, relative humidity, the uh, surface potential, which is uh, uh, proportional to the uh, work function of the object. Is uh, uh, um, is uh, is uh, is different, and uh, that means that uh, if you are doing uh, dealing with uh, um, uh, with devices based on uh, the graphene, you should uh, understand uh, what are and what are the conditions, and uh, you must encapsulate them. Uh, another very interesting application of Kelvin probe microscopy combined with uh, uh, with uh, some uh, optical microscopy. Uh, is uh, was the, the study of uh, a combi of uh, uh, solar cells, uh, solar cell structures with local pho photo excit excitation. Uh, thing is that uh, in our system uh, we can uh, uh, we can combine our AFM system together with high aperture uh, uh, objective, and uh, in this case in this case uh, in this uh, the position of the laser of this objective can also be. Uh, positioned with high accuracy independently from the tip. So on the, on these uh, images in, below, you can see that uh, here is the laser spot, and we could Im uh, we could uh, eliminate uh, the sample with two types of lasers. And this is AFM tip, and here and uh, with the AFM tip, we could uh, see the Kelvin probe response. And uh, uh, you, you see the here here you see the uh, profiles which were taken in Kelvin probe, and uh, on the top you see the theoretical uh, estimation and uh, uh, the signal which is uh, really measured. And uh, the uh, the most important thing is that uh, when you design the new uh, like uh, solar cell type, the uh, the uh, essential thing is to find the most weak uh, uh, junction in in the cell. And uh, thus, uh, we uh, we showed the approach of how this can be done uh, on uh, different uh, solar cell uh, cross sections. A uh, few words about uh, magnetic force microscopy. So, if we if we use a magnetized tip, uh, we can uh, uh, measure the magnetic response uh, of the uh, of the sample if we have uh, magnetization in the different directions, and. Uh, uh, also, at the same time, we can apply the external magnetic field, which is controlled from the controller and the software, and uh, it can be done in a vertical direction and in plane. So, in this example, uh, you see how the domain structure of yttrium ferrous garnet uh, was changing with applying uh, different uh, values of, my, uh, of magnetic field in vertical direction. And uh, here, okay. I'll, uh, and, and on this slide, uh, we applied uh, our our customers applied the uh, magnetic field in a uh, in plane direction, looking at how the polarization uh, magnetic polarization of uh, nanotubes is changing. And finally, a few words uh, about uh, nanolithography. So together with imaging, you can uh, modify uh, the sample using the AFM tip. And uh, we can do it in electrical way or in mechanical way. Here, you, you, it is shown how the uh, surface is modified by applying voltage in different points. And uh, uh, here is one of the works uh, which was uh, uh, which was uh, published in uh, uh, the Nature Materials uh, uh, about the nanolithography. So the, the AFM tip uh, changed uh, changed the hydrophobic uh, state of uh, OTS, uh, which became uh, uh, hydro hydrophilic in the, under the tip uh, of AFM. And in this work, uh, uh, the nanolithography could, uh, uh, was shown uh, to, to make structures uh, uh, on, on the surface and uh, then to erase them. So we, when, uh, when the um, voltage is applied, uh, Within uh, some uh, some bounds, uh, the researchers could uh, draw something and uh, and erase it. 
and uh, like just few words about uh, like uh, all the guys which uh, can do this uh, all, all, all the examples uh, which I showed today were done either by other uh, our colleagues uh, or by our customers uh, with the, uh, by means of uh, our AFMs and uh, so uh, there are a couple of uh, different uh, main models so this is the simplest one like uh, for education and basic research this one uh, next uh, is a fully fully automated EFM uh, this one uh, Integra is uh, one of the most powerful EFMs and uh, it can be combined uh, with the different techniques uh, like magnet, external magnet external electrical field vacuum and uh, also with uh, uh, optical techniques like uh, IFM, Confocal Raman, and uh, Nana IR. And uh, Vega is uh, used for big samples. So I uh, forward, thank you for your attention, first of all, and uh, I forward uh, the word to, my, uh, to Oleg, and he will uh, uh, be talking about uh, the combination of EFM and Raman. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Stanislav. Uh, that was really good. Um, uh, so far, we don't have questions. Uh, I guess uh, your presentation don't, was really don't hesitate. Don't hesitate. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so please, again, uh, everyone, uh, in a small window on your screen, there's a button called questions. Please uh, feel free to send us questions. We'll try to address them during the webinar. And if uh, we're out of time, we will definitely address it afterwards and send the uh, answers by email. So um, uh, without further ado, let me uh, start with the, uh, my lecture uh, about the integration of uh, atomic force microscopy with the confocal uh, Raman. So uh, one of the systems that we uh, introduced uh, over a decade ago uh, to the market, to the global market, it's called Spectra. Uh, it's uh, grown to the uh, second generation called Spectra 2, which allows us uh, to deliver to our customers a fully integrated um, system, first of all. Uh, it doesn't require much of the uh, um, hands work from the customer. So basically, this the AFM uh, portion of the of the system. All the user need is to uh, load the sample, install install the cantilever, and that's pretty much it. Everything else is being controlled through the software. Uh, since we originally were founded as an AFM company, uh, we built all of our optics around the AFM, which reduces drastically all the noise noises of the system, and also that brings in more than 40 different AFM modes built in by default into the system. And, uh, by, uh, by built in, I mean that uh, our users, they don't really need to buy additional uh, preamplifiers or holders or anything else to go over the huge amount of different AFM and confocal Raman techniques. Uh, talking about the confocal Raman part, uh, there's a large spectrometer. We have several combinations of them. Uh, the most advanced one, works with up to five different lasers, so the user can switch between the lasers automatically. Uh, for instance, you do the research with uh, one laser, let's say 473 nanometer laser, and then you see a lot of fluorescence, which you would like to get rid of. So through the software, you just switch uh, the laser to another one, and I'll show you how to, to do that in the um, schematics a little bit later. And then just run the system with, uh, let's say, four, uh, 633 nanometer laser or 785. Uh, the system comes also with a different uh, set of the uh, detectors. You can work with the CCD detector for the Raman. Uh, there's also installed the PMT for the uh, Rayleigh scattering uh, signals. And also system can be uh, supplied with the APD detector or even electromultiplying, so-called EMCCD for fast uh, uh, scanning. Uh, inside of the spectrometer, and I'll show you on the next slide what can be done. Also, you, uh, the, you can use uh, different uh, filters, different polarization filters, uh, and work in uh, uh, and detect low frequency Raman signals as well as Stokes and anti Stokes signals. And the anti Stokes signal is quite important, especially uh, if the researcher works with the temperature dependent materials. 
And as I mentioned, you can also control the polarization. You can rotate it. You can uh, put different uh, filters. And the most advanced mode that is built into the system is called the tip enhanced Rama scattering. And that's going to be uh, the last section of the of my lecture. I'll show you how it works. I'll show the examples of it. So, um, so the next one. I'm sorry. Um, okay. So. Uh, Talking about different techniques, uh, like uh, Dr. Lesman uh, was talking about the atomic force microscopy, and also uh, we can do the scanning tunnel microscopy. It is known that the scanning tunnel microscopy and AFM, they can go in the resolution down to nanometer or even below, especially the STM down to atomic resolution. However, it's been known also uh, that the optical microscopes, they have a uh, quite big limitation uh, by the diffraction limit, actually. So the researchers were struggling how to see uh, different optical properties of the samples, which has the resolution way below the diffraction limit. Uh, uh, several years after that, there's uh, the confocal microscopes were developed, which kind of slightly um, enhanced the resolution, but not uh, good enough to see the uh, features on the sample with one, two, 10 nanometer resolution or, or even uh, 50 nanometer resolution. So uh, the combination of AFM and Raman or STM and Raman allows to uh, create kind of a trick in the physics and to go beyond the diffraction limb, basically to uh, allow the researchers to obtain the optical uh, properties of the sample with the resolution way below the uh, diffraction limit. So just give you an example. If we use a uh, 532 nanometer laser with a high resolution objective, uh, let's say it's going to be a 100x objective, the optical resolution, the spatial resolution is going to be around uh, 250 nanometers, 300 nanometers, depending on the um, conditions. However, when it's combined with atomic force microscope or STM and when it used uh, the special probe, and I will show you the examples, the resolution can be broken down to tens of nanometers and in some cases even uh, one nanometer. So uh, the atomic force microscope combined with uh, AFM uh, in our system can be represented in uh, several configurations. One and the most common uh, config configuration is the upright configuration when we use the uh, uh, high, high uh, resolution 100x objective from the top. So we excite the sample from the top and we collect from the top. And here's we have the uh, uh, AFM probe or STM probe under the uh, under the object. In this case, this the sample is scanning and we collect this information. Uh, in another uh, configuration that we uh, offer in our system is an inverted configuration when we have the objective going from the bottom. So you can uh, excite the sample from the bottom and still collect uh, in additional information by the probe from the bottom. However, uh, in most of the uh, the invert configuration has the limitation because it requires the sample to be transparent. So a lot of researchers would want to have actually both systems combined together so they have the versatility on working with different samples, uh, transparent, non-transparent, or create different um, experiments when they need to excite the sample, uh, let's say, from the top and they collect data from the bottom or vice versa. So this can be realized and in both cases, uh, we have the uh, sample holder here, we have the pro, we have a 100x objective from the top, 100x objective from the bottom with different NAs, and that's how we can realize uh, these techniques. Uh, another additional um, optical access to the sample is the side illumination. This is not really common um, configuration because when you do the side illumination, uh, the confocal Raman uh, becomes a little bit uh, not really confocal, and the reason is uh, the shape of this uh, of the uh, laser is going to be uh, more elliptical rather than uh, circular. So that kind of brings in questionable questions to the data obtained. However, the side illumination in some cases helps to obtain uh, tip enhanced Raman. So now uh, switching to the optical scheme of the uh, spectrometer, ju just to give you an idea how it works and what can be changed and what's automated. So here's, uh, just for the example, here's the two, uh, three ports for the lasers, but I, as I mentioned before, it can be 
upgrade to up to five different lasers. So different lasers coming into the spectrometer, they go through the variable or neutral density filter. So the researcher can precisely change the intensity of the laser, which is very important because when you work with a high resolution objective and you, focus, you tightly focus the laser on the sample, and if you pump in a lot of power, you can basically burn the sample, which you don't really want to do, and therefore you want to reduce the, uh, the intensity. Then the second part is the uh, beam expander. It's a motorized beam expander. It consists of uh, three, actually three different lenses. Uh, they can, uh, the beam expander can change the uh, diameter of the laser. Because we're working with the different lasers, uh, the diameter of the lasers changes. However, when since we use the same objective, 100x objective for the for all the lasers, we want the diameter of the laser be, be exactly as the diameter of the objective entrance pupil. So uh, that's why we can change this diameter to fulfill the pupil so not we don't lose the signal or we don't overfill the objective. Then the laser goes uh, through the uh, some set of mirrors and here we can uh, install uh, and usually install the polarization um, filters like uh, uh, half lambda or a quarter of the lambda which can be rotated so the user can control the polarization. And then the laser hits the H filter and goes into the AFM system. It's very important here we have uh, the uh, mirror which is installed on top of the piezo uh, scanner with the um, closed loop sensors, which allows us to precisely control the position of the laser, which is very important because in some experiments, you, you want to have the end of the uh, probe be inside of the uh, focused beam of the laser, or in some experiments like the light transportation, you want the laser to be away from the probe. So using this control of the uh, piezo scanner, you can do that. And once the laser is reflected back from the sample, it goes uh, inside of the system. And now uh, what's, uh, what usually happens here, if we have the H filter here, the H filter cuts off everything from the laser line and below. Uh, and then the um, this working system, uh, signal goes this direction. The laser line, however, reflects from the H filter and goes directly into the PMT. Therefore, a researcher can collect actually the full spectrum of the signal. It can collect the laser line or, or Rayleigh scattered uh, information and also the Raman uh, information. If we install, and that can be done also, uh, uh, instead of the H filter, if we install the uh, notch filter, uh, which usually cuts off only the laser lane, lane and allows the uh, everything above and below the laser lane goes in here. In this case, we collect the stokes, anti-stokes, uh, and the laser by the PMT. So from here, the signal goes into the monochromator, which has uh, four different gratings. Um, using which you can uh, achieve different uh, spectral resolution, and then goes into the CCD camera. Um, we, again, we use different uh, CCD cameras, uh, like EMCCD camera, CCD camera from Andor, Princeton instruments, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the idea. Again, that works exactly the same for the inverted configuration. Uh, the laser will be coming only from the bottom of the sample, and that works uh, exactly the same when you have the full system from the top and from the bottom. Uh, you just choose which uh, way to excite uh, the sample. Very important part to, to mention about the monochromator is the sensitivity. Uh, some of the monochromators, especially, uh, well, the spectrometers, especially at their early age of their existence, they were using a lot of different fibers to deliver the laser, to collect the laser. But the problem with the fibers, uh, single mode or multi mode uh, fibers, that they lose a lot of signals. Say, uh, even single mode fiber, it loses about 40% of the signal one way. So imagine if you uh, excite the sample through the fiber and then collect it by the fiber, you lose 40% one way and 40% of the uh, good signal on the back way, which is really, really unacceptable, especially for the uh, sensitive uh, samples. In our case, we don't use any fiber, we use just the mirrors. So the basically uh, with the mirrors and the grading with the high reflectivity, uh, we estimate the spectrometer throughput about 62 to 77%, which is really, really high. Uh, to the uh, comparing to the um, availability on the market. 
And the entire system, again, depending on the configuration and which objective is going to be used, uh, the uh, optical throughput uh, is from 57 to 71%. It just depends on the different ratings and the uh, objectives. But this uh, high sensitivity and high throughput, high optical throughput of the system allows us to collect uh, even like single photons. So it's really, really important. Um, Another uh, feature or very important stuff uh, that you can obtain with, from the combination of AFM and Raman is so-called the focus tracking. So basically, when you do just the confocal Raman scanning of the sample and say you have the uh, very rough sample, you can focus the laser at the bottom of the sample. And then once you start scanning, at some point, your focus is going to be somewhere else, not on the samples. And therefore, you're going to be getting the blurry images which is not really acceptable. However, when you combine the uh, confocal Raman with the AFM, what usually happens is that uh, the researcher focuses the laser at the very end of the tip. And because the feedback is kept by the tip and the tip is always on the, on the sample, during the scan, the focus is gonna be staying at the very end of the tip and therefore uh, collecting very sharp and crisp images. Uh, here's a, one of the examples, and I will show you a little bit more of the examples of this uh, tracking. Uh, here's the pharmaceutical tablet, which is quite rough uh, surface, about the six uh, microns. And you can imagine if you use the uh, standard laser, let's say 532 nanometer laser, the Z depth is going to be about, uh, what, like a, a half micron. Uh, and the uh, profile of the surface, six microns. So you're going to be definitely out of the uh, focus. As you can see here, very blurry image. However, with the AFM, uh, when you start scanning, uh, the focus of the laser is always on the surface of the uh, uh, sample. And therefore, you get a lot of information uh, correctly. Uh, how, um, going further, uh, the confocal Raman, we don't, uh, when we combine the confocal Raman with AFM, we don't really sacrifice anything from the confocal part. And as you can see here on this example, we still perform the 3D scanning, which means that the laser can move uh, not only in X and Y direction, but we can also uh, scan in Z direction. Uh, here's the uh, uh, example of the polystyrene balls uh, scanned in 3D direction and the software then combine this image and then you can just basically um, create different slices of these images and see how the uh, signals from the sample uh, changes. Again, that's uh, we don't sacrifice the confocal Raman uh, features, we just add or if you will, we enhance them with atomic force microscopy. Uh, getting back uh, to the notch filters and the low frequency, as I mentioned before, uh, using the uh, uh, very uh, high uh, high quality notch filters, what we can also uh, achieve is a very low uh, Raman frequency uh, detection. As you can see here on the on the example, uh, and that's again this spectra is just for the example. So this is the laser lane. And here's the sum data at 28 receptacle centimeters. The standard H filters or notch filters, they usually cut off the signal somewhere at 100, 150 receptacle centimeters. So if you use this very standard uh, filters, you're not going to be seeing a lot of data here near the uh, laser line. However, with the high quality notch filters or H filters, we can cut off the lane uh, somewhere at 10, 15 receptacle centimeters, somewhere here and then collect all the data. So it's all in there, it's all included in the system and that's uh, important, especially when you work with the uh, small grading so you can collect the broad spectrum uh, from the sample and see what's in there, what's the chemical information you can obtain from it. Uh, here's one of the examples of the combined AFM Raman application. Remember, the, as I mentioned before, when we focus the uh, laser of the uh, Raman to the very end of the tip and we start scanning, the tip is tracking the surface. In the meantime, the controller can apply all the AFM techniques, just like Dr. Lesman was talking about uh, before me. Uh, and we can collect all this uh, data simultaneously with Raman. As you can see here, there's some examples of the graphene sheets 
We can see here the lateral force microscopy. We can see the electrostatic force microscopy, force modulation. Of course, the topography, uh, that's a very standard. And also we can we call like the Raman map, uh, confocal relay uh, microscopy with the PMT. Uh, we can uh, collect different different bands for the Raman, the full spectrum or just the band. And we can collect also the um, surface potential, so-called Kelvin probe uh, microscopy. That was uh, done basically about like 10, 15, uh, 10 8 years ago. But uh, furthermore, we, we move uh, forward and added even more techniques into that to create the, the most sophisticated system so that the researchers would have a powerful machine in their lab to uh, basically create any, um, any experiment they want. So we added the uh, non-oscillatory mode or so-called hybrid AFM mode to provide the uh, researchers uh, not only with the topo uh, topography, or not only the surface uh, characteristics or chemical characteristics from the Kampoko Raman, but also the nanomechanical. Here's an example, uh, and I'll show a little bit more of the polymer blend. When we do the AFM and Raman on it, we can see the, it's a, just an optics white light. We can see the topography, and we can collect the adhesion maps, stiffness maps, as, along with the Raman, uh, different maps for, maps for Raman, um, DC by DV or DC by DZ, the, the electric permittivity. It's all done, as you can see, from the exactly the same spot. So basically what you can do, you can just basically overlay. Uh, it is very important to mention that uh, the AFM doesn't really give uh, the chemical information about, about the sample, while the confocal Raman doesn't really give the topography of the sample. So sometimes uh, research can be frustrated what's in there and where it's uh, positioned, but combining two of them the topography for, uh, or surface properties, along with the chemical uh, properties all together, the researchers get the, like 100% of the information from the sample. Uh, here's another example of the uh, PC PVAC blend, uh, polymer blend. Here's the uh, just the topography. And again, from the topography, we cannot really distinguish which polymer is there, where is the uh, PVAC or PS, we don't really know, but uh, along with the, uh, AFM will also obtain the Raman data, and now we can clearly see where uh, which uh, polymer is, and we can uh, clearly define them. Another good example here is the uh, study of the wood cells. And again, here uh, on the uh, topography uh, side, we can see some structure, but we cannot really understand what's there. It's just We can just assume. The Raman gives us a little bit more information. We can see, we can uh, identify the cellulose, we can uh, identify the lignin, we can overlay them. We can see exactly what's going on on the sample so that the researchers can see uh, what can be done next in order to modify or how to treat the sample to create their uh, research. Uh, another example is here the malaria infected red blood cell. And again, same situation here, the topography gives some information, the Raman map gives another information, but once it's overlaid, you can see a lot of information uh, and you can see exactly what's going on with the, with the sample. So uh, another good uh, sample uh, for the focus tracking uh, is an um, uh, anodine tablet. As you can see here on the uh, topography, you cannot really understand what's going on there. We can, you cannot distinguish any of the material there, just the topography, some rough topography. And you go to the AFM phase, you don't see it as, as well. But once you move to the Raman, and thanks for the tracking, uh, focus tracking on the sample, we can see with the high resolution, we can understand where the aspirin, the green one, or where the paracetamol, uh, the red one. So that's uh, another good example how it works. Uh, I mentioned before again that the AFM comes with the fully uh, loaded uh, modes in there, and that's the good example here of the um, study of the flakes. Here we can see the photoluminescence. Here, here we see the topography, and we also can uh, obtain the uh, surface potential from the same flakes and also the Raman. So here's the optical image of, of these flakes, and you can see. That's a lot of information, right? Like we see the multi-layer, we see the bi-layer, bi we see the monolayer, and we can distinguish which is there. Uh, from the AFM topography, you cannot really distinguish much of it. Maybe from the thickness of the layers, but you cannot really understand which is which. So, 
another good example is the photocurrent mapping and the localized optical excitation. Um, Dr. Lisman mentioned about that before. One of the applications when you excite the sample by the high resolution objective uh, at some point, and then you measure uh, different properties of the sample in the topography. Uh, like like here, or you can also do uh, run the conductivity map. Imagine that let's say it's going to be a dark room. You run this uh, sample. You're trying to get the conductivity map, and there is no response. But once you add this laser, once you excite the sample, there is some photoconductivity, and you can measure it, and you can exactly see where uh, the current flows through. And also, you can add the Raman map to distinguish uh, what's going on with the sample. Uh, there's so many different applications for AFM and Raman. Well, unfortunately, we don't have much time to go through all of them. Uh, you can do it in liquids, you can do it under the ambient condition or controlled environment under elevated humidity. Uh, you can even apply different magnetic fields. There's so many different applications and they, uh, that's why the, we call this Integra Spectra 2 system is a very, very sophisticated system because it's so fully loaded with different modes that can cover basically unlimited uh, applications. So uh, let's switch to another application, very special one, tip enhanced Raman. So uh, to make it really uh, short, I'll try to explain it really fast how it works. So uh, for tip enhanced Raman uh, system, what's important is to have the specifically prepared the probe, uh, which is usually covered by some sort of the noble metal, like a silver, gold, platinum, or a mixture of them. And what's important about the sample, it has to be prepared some certain way so that it, uh, there's some um, polaritons uh, occurs at the very end of the tip. So once we have the tightly focused laser beam, the Raman laser usually is 532 nanometer laser or 633 nanometer laser, depending on the uh, which metal is used for the terse tip. Somewhere in that tip, the Z polarization of the light is going to be good enough to excite those polaritons. And therefore, the, uh, the enhancement of the signal uh, occurs. Which What it means is that basically the end of the tip becomes the second source of the uh, light. And since this is uh, since the optical, resol uh, optical resolution is defined by the size of the uh, source, and if we have the t uh, end of the tip about 10 nanometers, so basically the optical resolution is going to, spatial optical resolution is going to be uh, about 10 nanometers. So that's how it works. And that works again in different configurations, just like I mentioned before. Uh, that can be done exactly the same way in inverted configuration when we excite from the bottom, in upright configuration when we excite from the uh, top. Uh, in some applications, it is better to use the side illumination because um, if tips are not good, if their sample is really um, not good for the terse, the side illumination kind of gives you a little bit of the advantage because it provides a little bit higher Z component of the polarization of the light, and therefore the chances to obtain terse is a little bit higher. Although uh, I know there is a uh, different groups uh, done research comparing different configurations for terse efficiency, like inverted, upright, and side illumination. And there's actually the publication about that. Uh, but they didn't really find much of the difference between uh, these, uh, these configurations. However, they mentioned that in some cases, the side illumination could be slightly better just because of the, um, the issues with the, um, with the sample. Or you can also do the tip enhanced Raman in full configuration, just like we offer with the uh, Spectra 2. And here's the several examples of the terse applications. Uh, this is the uh, silica germanium st uh, structure. As you can see, the period is 95 uh, nanometer. And here's the topography of it. And here's the silicon peak intensity in Raman and silica ger uh, germanium intensity. And the resolution of these maps is about 50 nanometers. So well-defined, clearly seen. And as you can imagine, if we take out the AFM portion from it and we use the uh, just the standard Kanpoko Raman, we're not going to be able to, defy, uh, to define these features because the resolution, the optical spatial resolution is going to be about 200, 300 nanometers. So it's going to be uh, just a big, big spot of the uh, silica or silica germanium intensity. Another uh, very well-defined uh, example is the carbon nanotubes. As you can see here, there's uh, the micro Raman map. Just like I mentioned, if we take out the AFM or STM here, we basically don't see much. So in this area, we don't see anything. 
here we see some big spots, some good response from the uh, graphene, uh, from the uh, carbon nanotube, but we cannot really define what's going on there. However, once we do the terse or nanorum, so-called, we can clearly define some features there, like this one, a uh, single uh, carbon nanotube with the uh, diameter of 14 nanometers, well defined. Uh, another example of the uh, TERS is uh, nanotapes formed by, from the uh, B amyloid peptides. And again, exactly the same. This uh, TERS was done in STM mode. So uh, the researchers did the STM topography to see the samples, and then they uh, did the TERS map. And you can see clearly uh, defined features of uh, the sample. And in this case, the resolution was a uh, a little bit less than 80 nanometers, and we're talking about the optical resolution. And again, I uh, don't want to really take uh, much of your time, and uh, the uh, TERS has a lot of different applications, and here's some of the examples actually published by our customers, and we have uh, more than hundreds of the uh, publications. Here's the carbon nanotube, the uh, TERS done on the DNA molecules, on the graphene, graphene oxide, TO monolayers, amyloid fibrils, um, different polymers. There's so many different applications. It's just, you got to remember uh, several things that it's very important for the TERS uh, to have a very stable system because the TERS occurs only inside of the uh, tightly focused uh, laser beam diameter of which is usually about like 300, 400 nanometers. So the system has to be very, very stable to keep the probe, the TERS probe inside of that uh, laser and uh, the second one uh, the second portion of it is the TERS probes itself our company uh, make this TERS uh, tips and but you can also uh, make them your own and we we can kind of guide you there help you there show some publications on how other researchers uh, prepare such tips um, and of course the preparation of the sample so uh, well thank you very much thanks for your uh, attention mm, I don't know if Stanislav, do you have any questions so far, or it was self-explanatory as well? Uh, um, our listeners are very modest, and <laughs> they they don't they don't ask any questions. Maybe or maybe we are not uh, maybe we are too clear or not clear at all. <laughs> uh anyway uh if you want to if you got any question you can uh write write to oleg uh you can see his email on the screen and uh uh hopefully this was uh, uh this uh, le two lectures uh, were uh, interesting for you and uh, don't hesitate we'll be in contact and uh i think uh, we can finish for today yeah right well thank you again everyone i i know it's a little bit late of your time so thank you very much for your time uh, spending with us it's been a pleasure uh and as the, dr lesson mentioned if you have any questions please send uh questions to my email we will also send a follow-up email to every one of yours with the recorded webinar so you can take a look on it later and maybe later you will have more questions so thank you very much again thank you <laughs>